Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello, guys, and welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Okay, this is going to be very special. I don't know if you've been watching the news lately, but uh, kind of the circulating in, in Fox News and Breitbart, uh, there was a soundbite of a, a prominent professor, and we have him here today. Uh, uh, he's going to very prominent professor. He's the director of bioethics at NYU. He's a published author, The Right to Be Loved. He's a very prominent speaker. Um, talking about bioethics and the ideas of uh, uh, ways to, um, in, you know, I guess really the proper way to say it is ideas of ways to affect behavior change, right, on a population-wide basis. And, um, you know, there were some startling sound bites, right? Uh, people are afraid he's going to take our meat away. Right. Uh, the juicy steak he talked about on uh, this, this, this lecture was about in January. Is that right, Dr. Liao? Did I pronounce uh, that right, by the way, your name? Just one more time. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's uh, Liao. 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 Okay, Liao. Okay, Ciao. So. Yeah, got it. Dr. Liao. <laughs> um, look, I'm very happy to have you here. I'm very honored to have you here. Uh, we may disagree, but I think I want to give you a chance to talk more than that little sound bite. And I want to hear your thoughts. And uh, so very happy to have you here. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you uh, for inviting me. Um, so it, maybe it's helpful if I just give a very quick overview of my view about this topic for you uh, and for your audience. Um, um, and then, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, so the general idea is that, you know, climate change is this really big problem. Uh, we've been trying to come up with solutions to it. You know, we get people to sort of try to recycle. Uh, we have uh, sort of market solutions, carbon taxes, and, and things like that. The Paris Agreement, we just uh, got back into the Paris Agreement, which is a good thing. Um, but uh, there are worries that uh, these measures are not going to be enough. And so some scientists are saying, you know, maybe we need to do something like geoengineering. So geoengineering is this thing where it involves, for example, spraying sulfate aerosols into the ozone layer. Um, but, you know, that could be really dangerous. We only have one ozone. If you destroy the ozone layer, you know, we're dead. And so in that context where people, scientists are, you know, taking seriously this idea that we may have to use uh, geoengineering uh, as a philosopher, as a, as a bio, bioethicist, you know, I said to myself, well, you know, what else have we not looked at in this space, you know, in terms of solutions? And so then I came upon this idea that maybe we can look at, you know, human engineering, um, so which is the biomedical modification of, you know, us in order to make us better at mitigating the effects of climate change. And so what are some examples of, um, you know, human engineering? And you know, in my work, I actually make clear, and this, uh, you know, I think Tucker Carlson didn't make this very clear, but everything I say here is intended to be voluntary, right? Nothing is coerced. It's supposed to be sort of up to individuals to uh, take. Um, and you, usually also I try to go for what I call win-win solutions. And I'll give an example of that. So win-win solutions are basically uh, things that, you know, you'll want to do. Uh, even, like people don't have to force you to do it. You'll just want to do it. So the example that I like to give is take iPhones, right? Nobody uh, needs to force you to buy an iPhone. People queue up when new versions come out, right? And so that's the space. That Those are the things that I I'm trying to look for uh, in terms of win-win solutions. <clears throat> so uh, the two examples that uh, Tucker Carlson talked about, and I'll just mention that uh, the first one will be very relevant uh, for this group. And so basically the idea is that about 18% of greenhouse gas uh, emissions come from livestock farming. Um, so if we can just curb our, you know, reduce our consumption, uh, meat consumption, red meat consumption, we could have a great effect on uh, the climate. Uh, uh. And, uh, you know, this is something that uh, a lot of people have said. 
Uh, and so, but in a lot of people, so there are people who just, you know, they love their meats and they won't give up any of it. Right. And so in, in that respect, there's nothing uh, that I can say or do to change the opinions of those people. And then there are already people who are vegetarians. And so they, they've already given up eating meat. And so, you know, there's that group. But there's this in-between group where, you know, like they don't, um, there are people who, um, they're not vegetarians, and, but they would be happy to reduce their meat consumption. So not give up meat, but just sort of like eat a bit less meat, you know, for a variety of reasons, health reasons, and so on and so forth. And even reducing a bit of meat could have a great effect on, um, you know, on the, on the climate. But, you know, they just find eating meat irresistible, right? And so how do they, how can we kind of help, uh, you know, with these people who want to give up eating, just reduce uh, eating a bit of meat, uh, but they find it difficult to do so. So the idea was, well, maybe we can create something, you know, you know eating is a, is a biological thing, right? Even sort of dieting is a kind of human engineering. You're kind of manipulating your body in a certain way, right? And so we know that, and we know that. And so the example I gave, uh, which became kind of controversial, was I, I gave an example from my own self because I'm, uh, I'm uh, milk intolerant. Right. So when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, well, there's sort of, you know, that means there are certain types of things that I don't want to eat. Right. Or I can't eat. Right. And so maybe if we, if, if we can think more about our biology, we can kind of tinker with our bio biology. We can affect the way we eat, uh, you know, like, you know, with uh, eat certain types of food. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, so, so the basic idea is that, um, you know, uh, so, you know, so here's a picture, which is about a meat patch, right? So there are ways of affecting uh, the way we eat meat. Uh, one of the things I suggested was we can create some sort of meat patch, kind of like nicotine patch, right? And that patch could, you know, you could take, you could put it on, take it off whenever you like. And when you put it on, it'll sort of produce certain sensations or effects on your body such that you may not want to eat the meat anymore. So for example, it could make the uh, meat uh, taste very sweet, right? And some people, when things are very sweet, they say, ugh, you know, I don't want to eat that anymore, right? So it could be as simple as that. In this case, uh, the picture behind me, it's uh, sort of, a, there's a professor from Oxford. He created this, uh, he sort of took this idea and he created a meat patch. And basically this meat patch produces a smell of bacon, Right. And so the idea is that when you smell bacon, you've become sated. Right. You now you feel like, OK, you've already had your share of meat. And so you don't want to eat more meat. And so this is actually being marketed right now. So so, you know, they, it's like being sold as five patches. Right. You can put it on your arm and somehow, you know, it's like basically working with your smell. Right. Uh, uh, you know, the, that that system. So anyways, that's that's one idea. Maybe I should pause there. Uh, do, you, do you want me to go on to the other one? I, I thought that one is probably no, the most relevant I, I, for you, your I'm audience. Gonna, I'm going to, one, I'm going to first highlight basically how what you're describing we're already doing in modern medicine. First of all, you brought up uh, in this clip, in this lecture you gave uh, about the uh, Lone Star Tick. Yeah. Right? And the Lone Star Tick uh, can produce a allergy to bovine proteins. Now, it's not the first time that we've used nature uh, for our own purposes. If you look at the tooth of a tick, it has many blood thinning properties and we've highlighted those and made them into drugs. You know, maybe you've seen a commercial, the lay audience, you know, for Xarelto. Do you want to sue your doctor for Xarelto? Do you want to sue your doctor for Eliquis? And uh, the reason why you'd want to sue your doctor for those is because they thin the blood and doctors don't often talk to their patients about what are the side effects. But we use these drugs, actually, it has a therapeutic purpose, right? We get all of our best drugs from nature and um, they prevent strokes in atrial fibrillation. So we've literally done what you've proposed already in another therapeutic class. And then I want to just bring up uh, this idea of taking something to make the, uh, to take away the pleasure of it, right? We've done this with alcohol, right? There's a medication called Anabuse. 
and there's another medication called naltrexone. And these two drugs, literally what they do is they take away the feeling of reward, right? And they also give you a little bit of nausea if you drink, uh, if you drink with it. That's the end abuse. There are these. So we've already done essentially the blueprint for what you're suggesting is already here, right? Which I think is what actually makes it a little bit more scary, right? Is that it could be very easily done. And, and I think that makes the fear that people get when they hear these ideas that much more uh, pronounced, mm. right? Uh, because uh, he's coming to take my meat away, right? And now I want to just you know, present you a different viewpoint, right? I know that there are uh, big organizations like Eat Lancet uh, that have talked about lowering meat consumption. Uh, in fact, the, you know, the weekly portion is maybe 100 grams is what they recommend. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, you know, if, you know, my, you know, my area of focus is metabolic health, diabetes, and obesity. And we have found that actually meat uh, consumption uh, in an interventional uh, way improves, you know, low carbohydrate diets, which are heavy in meat, uh, improve diabetes, you know, they're effective for weight loss. Um, and so when the guidelines coming from above say limit meat, right, and yet we have these populations which are growing, you know, obesity and diabetes, which are growing, um, when we have these populations that seem to benefit from meat consumption, mm -hmm. I get a little bit worried, right? I get a little bit worried that are we missing, are we, you know, are we basically uh, looking at food frequency questionnaires and population-based data that are saying one signal that, hey, you could be healthier without meat, right? And are we not paying enough attention to shorter term trials that are six months to a year that say, hey, wait a second, maybe meat's not so bad, especially for obesity and diabetes. And here's the other point, right? We've looked at meat uh, supplementation and uh, in children, right? You know, in New York City, you're in New York City, you know, just like I am. And there in New York, there's Meatless Mondays, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And this is, uh, this was really applauded by environmentalists as a great first step. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, consider that meat supplementation in children prevents stunting and it actually meat supplementation in children uh, increases IQ mm -hmm. uh, because of the nutritional value that it provides, and you think, who are the people most likely to get harmed by this policy? Mm -hmm. I think it's people who couldn't afford, you know, the, the uh, you know, supplements of uh, the absence of, you know, you know having mm -hmm. to supplement in the absence of meat. You know the very well-off families that otherwise have access to say fish or uh, other you know more nutritious vegetables like uh, avocados right so the people most likely to suffer uh, from a policy that restricts meat right uh, may be the poorest people with the least access to food who mm -hmm. potentially may benefit so with these cultural and socioeconomic uh, considerations you know, should we even be talking about limiting meat? I mean, that's mm -hmm. my first question. Sorry, I know this is, yeah. you know, a long-winded question, but is it more complicated than, hey, the environment will benefit from meat reduction and this is what we should do? Yeah, that's yeah. a great question. And thank you for that. And, you know, uh, first of all, I just want to say, you know, great examples about sort of the uh, end abuse and, uh, all, you know, sort of the fact that, um, you know, basically when I mentioned the long start tick, I was trying to uh, also suggest that the, the biological mechanism is already there. Um, you know, it's, it's possible. Not that that's exactly what we should do. They're sort of, of course, uh, whatever you do, it's got to uh, meet the market, you know, marketing test, right? People have to want to do it. Otherwise, you're not going to um, persuade anybody to do it, right? Um, and it wouldn't be a win-win solution, as I was saying earlier. Um, on your question about whether we should, um, um, you know, sort of just limit meat. Uh, so, uh, so to be completely transparent, I'm a meat eater. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a vegetarian. Uh, so I totally share and agree with you about the nutritional value of meat. 
Um, and so I think there are very a variety of reasons why, you know, you've given all the very good reasons why we should be eating meat. So, uh, so what I would, I, so I take what I was saying not to be against that at all, but you know, what's true is that what, what's true in the environmental context is that certain types of meats uh, have, you know, you know, they have greater effect on the greenhouse gas emissions, right? So in particular, the red meat, right? So we're not talking about fish, we're not talking about chicken, we're talking mainly about cows and things like that. And so the idea here is that, um, uh, and so the thought is, well, maybe we can just limit those types, like sort of reduce our consumption of those meat, not eliminate, like, you know, people can still have their juicy steaks, but, you know, sort of, can, can we reduce the consumption of that? And is that enough? Uh, that, that's one question. Is that, uh, and could that be, could we do that in order to sort of offset, you know, to help the climate? Um, and then, but the follow-up question that I, that I don't know the answer to, and you may know the answer to, is what's the effect of limiting just red meat, like sort of reducing red meat? So suppose that, you know, people now, you know, the public policy is such that we make sure that children have fish and chicken and eggs and things like that, sort of a lot of low carb, other low carb things. Sorry, do you want me to repeat that? Because there, I don't know. Yeah, is that here. the NYU sirens? Yes, the NYU siren going. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, for the no, we heard it. We, I think we heard it. You know, uh, should we replace, you know, it, what happens if you're nutritionally replete? You're eating plenty of fish and eggs and, and uh, would there be an environmental benefit to just particularly red meat reduction? I yeah. think that's kind of the question you're posing. Yeah, or, or would there be a health uh, detriment if you kind of reduce just red meat consumption, but you still get all the other types of meat. So that's an empiric, that's a scientific question and you would know more than I would about it. My, I, I guess I was thinking that if you uh, still get to eat fish and chicken and eggs and all these other things, and then maybe occasionally red meat, but just not like just reduce the consumption, that wouldn't affect your health that much. But I could be wrong about that. So uh, I'm, you know, I stand like. Uh, no, I mean, look, it's a, it's a, I don't think it's been effectively studied. I mean, certain populations have been very healthy without red meat. Yeah. You know, there are some populations that, you know, have predominantly eaten, you know, fish and rice, for example, and, right. and uh, didn't have metabolic issues until fairly le recently in history. Uh, you know, for example, Asian, sub Asian populations consisted mainly off of rice as the backbone of the diet and never had metabolic issue. So I think, uh, but, you know, I guess the question becomes is, um, you know, what is the stated goal and what are the negative outcomes of maybe that goal? And now if the goal is uh, environment, right? And that is the focus, right? Um, and there are potentially negative consequences of limiting red meat, whether it's preference, whether it's health outcomes. Um, is that the best, uh, is that the lowest hanging fruit in terms of the stated goal, which is can we, you know, infect the environment? Can we impact the environment in a positive way through behavior change? Now, I would, I would just say as, some, as a meat lover, right? And I wasn't always that way, but as a meat lover, you know, I noted something, and this isn't scientific evidence, but when we saw the decrease in travel from the COVID pandemic uh, and the reduction in, uh, uh, you know, I guess, uh, transportation emissions, uh, I thought to myself, wow, you know, here we have a pandemic that created a significant amount of behavior change instantly. And we saw the Niagara Falls water clearing up. We saw the smog in China decreasing, you know, direct impacts instantly from behavior change. Um, and I, it made me wonder, like, is the focus on meat, as a meat lover, is the focus mm -hmm. on meat reduction uh, the more ethical, um, the more ethical uh, uh, approach, given that maybe you know, the greenhouse gas emissions are modestly affected by red meat, maybe 20%, I think you quoted in your lecture. Right. There's mm -hmm. some people who may argue, you know, that that's, you know, uh, you know, if you don't, if you look at the carbon sequestered from the soil, there's a lot of people who have different ways of looking at the number, but let's just say it's 
mm-hmm. you know, should we focus on the 80% mm-hmm. or should we focus on the 20%? And really the pandemic made me think that maybe the more ethical thing, and you tell me, you know, should be maybe focused on that 80%. Am I mm-hmm. wrong? Am I wrong? You know, is it just the biased meat lover in me that's like wants to make people, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, focus on that 80%? What, what do you think about when I say, hey, that 20%, you know, if we focus on that, the really poor and the cultural sensitivities, those people may be affected. So what what do you, like ethically speaking, what should we do? That, yeah, I mean, this is, that's a great question. So basically it's, you know, what philosophers uh, call imperfect obligation. You know, maybe there's a duty to help the climate, but we kind of don't know exactly what we should be doing. Like, you know, is it reduce our consumption of meat? Is it travel less, you know, less air travel? Is it, you know, what, what is it, you know? And, um, and it's, it's kind of like, it's because it's an imperfect obligation. It's left up to us to figure out which ones we want to do first. Right. Um, and so my view, I generally, I don't think that there's a silver bullet. I don't think there's like one thing that you can or, you know, do to help the climate. It's a sort of, it's uh, the climate change is a very complex problem. It's the, there are many, uh, sources is it's also not just air travel it's also like car like transportation it's also there's a bit of the you know the way we farm and things like that but it's a bunch of things right that together contribute to the problem and so the unpacking the the sort of dealing with it probably we need sort of different approaches and so in that context i guess um you know um it, it's possible maybe we can do we can solve the um you know climate change without uh, sort of uh, telling people to restrict uh, meat consumption, and if if we if there's a way of doing that, great, you know. So I think you know we we want to come up with solutions that our people are happy with, and that at the same time um, sort of uh, deal with the problem. That's that would be a win win solution. So if a lot of people look, they really love their meat, and you know that we're trying to push them in that direction, that would not be good. So, you know, so I think we need to be open to that. Um, and so, and that's why sort of in my, um, in my talks, I talk about other, you know, other types of solutions, right? So let me just give one example. Um, and, you know, we can come back to the diet thing. So what, what do I mean by win-win solution? So here, here's a more sci-fi example, you know, the meat example as uh, Dr. Trolla said is, you know, I was trying to show example, give examples that are more realistic. This one is slightly more sci-fi, but imagine, so, you know, cats can see just as well as we can during the day, but about seven times uh, better than we can at night. And we know that because, you know, well, cats have night vision, right? Um, so, you, and, you know, uh, th- both Dr. Cho and I live in New York. So, you know, if you fly into New York back in the days when we used to fly, you'll see that all the lights, there's so much light on every night in big cities, right? And just across the globe, every single night, that's a lot of energy, right? So just imagine that we can have night vision, right? So eyes where you can see just as well during the day, but seven times better at night, just so we can like reduce our energy consumption, uh, like by many folds, you know, if we just have better night vision, right? Um, And that I think, so now if I pose the question to you all, you know, how many people would you be willing to have this kind of eye, right? So you can see just as well during the day, but just seven times better at night. Like, you know, I, 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 for one, would just sign up, you know, I have very bad eyes, I'm wearing contacts right now. So it's like, sign me up, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. So, you know, perfectly happy to have it. And so that's what I, and, you know, and that's what I mean by a win-win solution in the sense that people would just be willing to have it. And, you know, and then it has this, in also this effect on the climate, right? And so that's the sort of the, the, the area that, you know, that I'm trying to find and locate uh, for us. In, in, you know, in this I, I think that uh, a lot of times, you know, a, a comment like that, right? I know, see, that's not even too far off, right? We are able to program cells. If you look at the way the adenovirus uh, vaccine vector, you know, the vaccine vectors work and mRNA vaccines work, we're programming the cell to create a protein that with which we're fighting against, right? Mm-hmm. So. 
this is the basis of these new amazing technologies. And I think that, you know, on one hand it's scary and on one hand it's brilliant. I mean, instantly we can program the body to make an antigen and we can protect a humanity, right? We can protect, so, so there's amazing therapeutic potential, but there's also, um, you know, with that so much, uh, uh, so much to worry about, you know, side effects one, uh, you know, am I going to get myocarditis? Am I going to get pericarditis? Am I going to get this rare, you know, clot disorder? Uh, am I going to get bleeding? And so to go from sci-fi to therapy, right, uh, becomes one, I mean, your what you propose is magnificent. Get, sign me up. If I have <laughs> no chance of side effects and night vision, give it to me. But yeah. the reality is, is I don't think we're far off from what you're proposing. Mm-hmm. And then, so in just to stick with the bioethics of it, the level of coercion that's happened with regards to vaccine uh, uptake, right, in the population is a little bit worrisome for me as somebody who's a liberty lover, Mm -hmm. right? They've had lotteries for vaccine uptake. They're recommending it in kids, uh, even before the FDA really, you know, qualified of it. We had doctors recommending the vaccine before the FDA had even approved it. So there's a level of coercion uh, and there's marketing campaigns now to get vaccinated. Um, and so um, sometimes, you know, you have this great idea and a magnificent technology, right? And then maybe we don't understand it all that well. And maybe there's somebody who will suffer. And when we coerce a population to do something, it becomes uh, concerning for people who may not want to accept the, those minor risks. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So how do yeah. we approach this? You know, I think you know ethics has really come into play here because even though you said it's sci-fi, it's not far off. Gene therapy, we are literally curing sickle cell, right? In some people, now we're we are able to override that genetic defect, mm-hmm. right? So with CRISPR technology and all of these new technologies that are coming out and the mRNA technology, DNA therapies, right? It's not far off, mm-hmm. but that's, that, that worries me. Mm-hmm. Should I be worried or should I? I mean, I'm terrified. I hear you <laughs> talking about, you know, uh, making kids, uh, you know, smaller in size, right? Yeah. The idea of making kids smaller in size to reduce their carbon footprint. And I am absolutely terrified i'm like mm-hmm. i i can't even think about that like the, my own moral values would tell me and i don't know if that's if my thinking is right but it's like my radar is off the charts like this mm-hmm. is wrong that's my yeah. gut instinct yeah so what let's help me understand this as a bioethicist yeah what i mean my gut is yeah be careful this is not good yeah. So tell me, tell me how I should, you know, you're a thinker, you're an imaginer. How should I, how do you reconcile the difference? You know, yeah. how do you reconcile these differences? Great questions. And, uh, you know, thank you for those comments. So just take the, so, you know, another one of the things I suggested was that, uh, you know, maybe we can have smaller people. And the idea is just that over a lifetime, you know, larger, like taller people tend to use more energy compared to smaller people, you know, just, you know, just think of a lifetime of resources so of trend, transporting someone bigger uh, rather than someone smaller. Now, why did I suggest that? Well, this was in the context, uh, this has to be contextualized a little bit. So uh, when I wrote the paper, Britain was considering a two child policy, right? Kind of like China's one child policy. So one child policy existed, you know, for like almost 30 years. Now they're relaxing it because they're having, uh, you know, birth rate problems in China. Um, but for a long time, you can only have one child. Now, if you're a liberty lover, right, that really restricts your liberty, right? To tell you, you can only have one child. It's very drastic. A lot of people would like to have more children. So, uh, you know, so the, the idea was that uh, with the having smaller children was, well, if you're really serious about telling people that they can only have one child or two children, right, then maybe we can also think about that. And if we want, and if you're doing this because of the climate, right, uh, then maybe it, it's more liberty enhancing 
uh, you know, so give it. So why don't we just give people like a family a sort of a greenhouse gas quota, right? And sort of let them decide whether they want to have one large child or two medium sized children, right? You know, like let them decide, you know, and that in some ways is a bit more liberty enhancing, right? Um, and and the, the idea is that, and, and, you know, the other thing I say is, you know, I'm not, we're not talking about uh, hobbit sized people or, you know, like uh, children who will be so small that they'll be, you know, get eaten by cats, right? So this, my suggestion was, it turned, you know, and I uh, looked this up a hundred years ago, we're on the average about 15 centimeters shorter, right? So if you go to Versailles, you kind of have to duck your head, right? The beds are smaller uh, and things like that. People on the average were, you know, t t uh, about 15 centimeters shorter and there was nothing wrong with it. You know, we had Einstein, Max Planck, Mary Curie, like lots of brilliant people lived 100 years ago, right? Tesla, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So we know that physiologically, that's just like, it's a stat, it's the status quo thing. We just happen now on the average for men to be what, five, nine and for, uh, or for women about five, four or something like that. Um, maybe it's changed now. Okay, so now, uh, no, you know, we can, we can, you know, as a philosopher, I think about this, you know, sort of imagine that in 50 years time, the average height is eight feet tall or nine feet tall, right? And now someone said, look, you know, maybe we should just row, row back to 50 years ago where people are 5'9 or 5'7. You know, probably there'll be the same conversation. There'll be the same outrage. Oh my God, you know, these people, they're going to roll, you know, roll the height back to, you know, 5 feet 9 and 5 feet 4. But we know right now that 5 feet 9 and 5 feet 4, we're doing just fine. We're live, we can live a decent life and, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a bit of a status quo bias, like thinking that somehow there's like, you know, you know, there's like an optimal height and we have it right now, right? Um, and in fact, uh, if you look at, um, I mean, if you just look at height, um, uh, centenarians, like people who live over a hundred years old, none of them is like over six feet tall, right? And that's because taller people, tend to have car cardiovascular diseases. They tend to have joint problems. So they actually die earlier. So they actually advantages to being a bit smaller. Um, you know, there's also like space travel, right? If people want to go to Mars, right? The first people going to Mars are not going to be very, I mean, you know, <laughs> not, they're not going to be very big because think of all the resources you, you need to keep those people alive, right? The bigger they are, the more resources you're going to need to keep them alive. So that's going to be a constraint. So those are things that, you know, I think it's already, we're already thinking about and so on and so forth. Now, to answer Dr. Tro's question, Dr. Tro might say, wow, but, you know, that's exactly why I'm so scared, right? This is very scary stuff, right? Um, and so there are a couple of things I want to say about that. The first of all, uh, the, the first thing is that, um, you know, you know, like, again, everything I say here, uh, these are intended to be voluntary. I've said that many times, in, you know, like in my print, et cetera, et cetera. There, you know, we shouldn't be forcing anybody. I'm, a, I'm as liberty loving, <laughs> you know, like I love my liberty. That's why I am in the academia, right? So nobody tells me what to do, you know? So I get to set my own research agenda and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, so I think liberty is very important. We need to respect that. We need to protect that, right? If we don't protect it, there's a chance that we'll lose it. And that's a bad thing. So we, you know, like definitely we don't want to do that. Um, at the same time, there are a lot of these interventions that could help us, that could make our lives better. Um, uh, that could make, for example, uh, going to Mars a possibility, Right. And here's why, like, you might think, well, you know, who cares about going to Mars? Right. Well, if you just think, um, uh, you know, uh, ahead, uh, we know that the sun is going to die out. Right. That's a fact. Right. Three billion years, four billion years, whatever. At some point, this, the sun will die out and this, everybody, all life on Earth will be gone. Right. So if we care about the survival of human species. Right our survival, like our, the survival of our children, we have to look at some of these technologies, right? And so it's a balance of risks and benefits. And I think that 
these technologies will enable us, like looking into them at least, some of them will allow us to engage in intergalactic space travel, go into the other planets, and so on and so forth. And so I think that's why it's important to think about those things. But we need to balance that. And Dr. Cho is absolutely right. We need to balance that, um, you know, against, you know, our other values that we hold, like liberty, right? Um, so, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, the more I hear you talk, the more I get the sense that this is like your suggestions or thought experiments right? Challenging the way we think more than necessarily a blueprint. You know, what I fear, what I fear, and you know, I think, you know, I want to come back to two things. Well, let's look at the potential negatives of human engineering, right? And I like, let's say lab leak is a complete conspiracy, but the fact that we could even think about it, right? And consider it as a possibility, right? Gain of function uh, testing, right? and potential negative consequences, right? Um, I don't know, it, it just makes me, you know, the recent events have made me more, even more cautious that maybe we need to really consider the ethics of what we're doing, mm -hmm. right? And the types of research that we do. As a thought experiment, as a doctor, and as somebody who studied pharmacotherapy, I know that understanding the genome and being able to manipulate genes has unlimited therapeutic potential, right? But then again, I mean, we have an example of potentially, you know, gain of function research, not mm -hmm. that it's, not that I'm believing the theory, but it, even entertaining the idea like we're doing now, it could have huge and disastrous consequences. Yeah. Uh, and we've all seen, you know, all the sci-fi movies with Will Smith where, you know, everybody becomes zombies. So, you know, what's, you know, are you challenging the way we think? My fear is people or organizations uh, like, mm -hmm. let's say, a government that wants to limit the amount of uh, offspring you can have or people that would benefit from uh, a population eating plant-based meat, right? Like uh, whole grains, you know, companies that make grains, these companies who expedited approval through the FDA to get their novel ingredients approved for plant-based meat. I wonder to what extent that they would uh, hijack your thought experiment for their own gains, uh, right? Hey, you can, we, you know, we'll give you another child, an artificial construct they created, mm -hmm. but it has to be small, right? Hey, you can still eat your meat. It has to be the plant-based meat with our novel you know, patented lentoglobin, which hasn't been tested. So, you know, so help me understand because I, I fear that like uh, the imaginary, I love the creative and imaginary thinking. I love that. I fear like that voice will be captured by people with not humanity's interests. And maybe that gain of function, the idea of the gain of function research resulting in potentially uh, disastrous outcomes is a great example of that. Uh, how do yeah. you understand, like, am I off base here? Am I, are my thoughts off base? I don't think you're off base at all. So I, um, and I think you're expressing very real worries and uh, they're, they're not even fictional. So I actually just published an edit collection called the ethics of artificial intelligence. Uh, it's all about AI. And so, uh, and similar debates are happening in the space of AI as well, right? So AI can be, you know, there are a lot of benefits to artificial intelligence. People are using it in the medical setting, you know, to diagnose cancer, you know, for self-driving cars and stuff like that, right? But there are governments that are also using uh, AI for things like facial recognition and to basically, you know, again, you know, to discriminate against minorities and, and things like that, right? And so I think what, what you're saying and is that you know once the technology is there it's kind of technologies are always dual use they can be used for good but they can also be used for very bad and the more powerful uh technology uh something is the more damage you can do right and so you know so uh so how do we deal with that right so one way to go is to just not develop any more technologies right we just stop you know be happy with what do we have now and just put a pause. But that's not humanity. 
Yeah, that's not that's not the way we are. Like we just like there will be somebody in the garage who will be developing certain things that will come out, and everybody will you know. And then once it's accessible, once it's online, you know, everybody else will know it, and then they'll get developed, right? So the other way is through good governance, right? And this is why international, like I'm a firm believer in sort of international cooperation, in sort of like just working together with other. Uh, people to come up with good rules and frameworks for you know for dealing with new novel technologies, right? And that's really really important because if we don't do that, Dr. Stroll's absolutely right. It's going to get really bad. Here, I'll just give you one example. So think, you know those Amman drones, right? Uh, well, it turns out that you can put uh, algorithms into those drones to attack people like without uh, any human control. Um, and you might think that's fictional, but in fact, in Turkey, that happened, right? There was a drone, a man drone that just uh, on its own attacked somebody, right? And that this is a this, uh, and you know, you can just imagine that more and more of these, you know, we're going to have these uh, lethal autonomous weapons running around, uh, killing human beings, and that's going to be a really bad world. And we don't want a world like that. And there's, uh, you know, either we just don't develop it, I think, but the cat's out of the back. There's, you know, like people already know how to do this. So the only other way and um, is to have international regulation. We need to come together and we need to really work to figure out and really punish people who violate those rules, who go against the rules and use those weapons, you know, on human beings. Um, and so in my work, I'll just say one other thing. In my work, uh, uh, I've been developing what I call a human rights context. And this is related to my book on the children's right to be loved. So there I develop a, a human rights framework. So I think we need a really robust human rights fr uh, framework to deal with a bunch of these problems. And that's really my starting point. And so my starting point is I think we have things like a right to bodily integrity, right? That means people shouldn't be putting things into our body if we don't want them to be put in our body. So there, I totally agree with Dr. Troy. But, you know, we should uh, make sure that our liberty is not in the fringe unless we're gonna harm other people, right? So that's a very uh, common liberal uh, notion, right? Uh, of like the importance of liberty and various other protections. You know, we need to have freedom of thought, freedom of speech and so on and so forth. And so, but, you know, I think um, in that space, uh, we do need to be careful. And some of what I say, Dr. Tro's right, their thought experiments, they could be used in bad ways. And I'm sort of conscious of that. And sort of in other areas, I've been trying to sort of promote international regulations, human rights, and so on and so forth. But there's always the rogue actor. Like, you know, you can say whatever you want to say, but if someone wants to do evil things with something, it's hard to stop them. Right. And that's why stopping like evildoers is kind of a collecting action problem. And this is why I wanted to be on this podcast and sort of talk to you, because I feel like there are a lot of people who like you, 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 you care about the ethics. Right. And insofar as you care about the ethics, we're on the same page. You know, we might disagree about the details of how to get there. But, you know, we both care about what doing what's right and what's wrong. And we're trying to do uh, the right things uh, for the world. And so I feel like we have a common language here, even though we might disagree about the substances of what, how we should get there. Yeah, look, I, I cannot thank you enough uh, for coming on. Uh, I, you, know, uh, you know, the pro me, you, you know, here's the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end off with this. You know, if I was, you know, one of the solutions you presented to, potential negative outcomes from technology um, is, you know, a global governance, right? And that global governance may be the only way to deal with the impending uh, flourishing of technology and new knowledge, especially in, uh, from a genetic standpoint. With what we know about genetics and our ability to manipulate therapies at this point, I think we're on a trajectory, a golden age of pharmaceutical uh, interventions is coming in the next 20 years. I firmly believe that. Um, now, when you look at global governance, you know, I think um, this recent pandemic has made people distrust 
public health to some extent, distrust uh, potential uh, uh, global governance, uh, the ability to govern globally. And one of the things I'd like to point out is the mere example of that you brought out in Turkey, the use of drones. You know, there was a war that literally used drones and nobody really did anything. You know, nobody really did anything between Azerbaijan and uh, mm -hmm. Armenia. Uh, the use of drones was almost, you know, ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, literally the world watched it unfold. So we've had this war that global governance failed. And we had, um, we have this pandemic where the disparate public health responses and, and unclear messaging have made people disenfranchised. And then the last thing, I'd like to say back to that idea of, you know, people and organizations that will abuse your message, right? If I was, you know, the impossible burger, I would want to prop you up to talk about me all day long, right? Um, because your message um, supports uh, the, the outcome of reduction, reducing meat, buying their product, and, uh, promotes maybe uh, the, those organizations like Eat Lancet, which are global mm -hmm. and may not, and while they may make sense on a population level, they may not make sense at the level of the individual, right? So if the solution is people and organizations, right, to the problem of advancing technology, I haven't been, I haven't been sold. You know, yeah. In fact, I don't, I don't believe it. And I'm going to leave it there because I think we're coming on time and I know you're a busy professor and you probably have to go. Um, but uh, I, I wonder if we can do what it is you suggest to truly yeah. govern globally in a fair way, an equitable way. Um, I pray for that. I hope for that. Um, and I'll leave it there. I'll give you a closing statement and guys, um, I just want to thank Dr. Liao, uh, author of The Right to Be Loved, Ethics of Artificial Intelligence, uh, prominent professor uh, at NYU, uh, director of bioethics. I really appreciate you coming on and stooping to the level of a lowly, you know, internal medicine, obesity medicine doctor. Um, this has really been uh, fun. And I'll let you, you know, you have the floor for a couple of minutes and then you can tell people where they can get your book and if they want to reach out to you, how they do that. Okay, great. Well, thank you. So, I, yeah, I, I think uh, I just, you know, wanted to comment on uh, what you said about the public health, uh, the inadequacy of the public health response to COVID-19 and, and the sort of the global governance issues. Uh, I think you're right. I, you know, our response just has been, uh, you know, bad to terrible in, you know, some ways. Uh, the issue, the question is whether, um, you know, whether we have any other alternatives and whether we can do better. Like, do we just throw the baby out of the bathwater or is this like what we have, you know? So human beings are not perfect. None of us is perfect. And we uh, did a lot of things that were not quite right, you know, with respect to the, you know, like with, the, with respect to the pandemic. We didn't warn people earlier, uh, early enough, for example. Um, but so the way I see it is we, we're never going to have a perfect system. We shouldn't be sort of let perfect be the enemy of the good or, or adequate or whatever. We sh you know, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. Governance is a work in progress. Unlike sort of where I sit in philosophy, where you have these idealized things, right? Real world is messy. And we, you know, I, you know I'm stating the obvious here. Uh, and so I think that... Um, um, you know, but but I think we shouldn't give up. My view is we shouldn't give up. We should work, you know, try to work with it, try to make it better, try to put in ideas. Like each of us has a responsibility to, you know, just put forward, you know, pour our weight, you know, do something to help the public out. We shouldn't also just rely on the government to kind of get things done. We need to do our things. Like we need to take initiatives. We need to get our voices out there. Uh, we need to do things in a way that's constructive. Right. There are a lot of th people do things that, but it's not like not all, not all of it's very constructive. Like we need to 
Uh, you know, if we think that the solution is not good, come up with an alternative, like come up with something better. Right. And so I think we need to be constructive because this is like our society, our world, and we're all in this together. The, the pandemic, if anything, has shown me that, look, the world's very interconnected and we got to do things to help each other uh, to get it right. Right. It's not just us. We can't just live in a bubble and think that, look, we just do our own thing. Everything will be good. It's it hasn't worked out that way. And it's, uh, you know, as the world gets more interconnected through these technologies, it's going to, we need to uh, more than ever work together. Yeah, I, 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 I think you're right. Um, I think a lot of my uh, amazement at your reaction, you know, at some of the sound bites and watching your lectures has been um, fear of change, one, and really a fear that this is a dystopian reality that could happen. And, um, and we shouldn't let fear drive us and we should come up with ways to work together and solve things. So I, I really applaud that message. And thank you so much for coming on. You didn't have to do this um, and you did it. So I really appreciate your time. And uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank yeah. you so much. I think we have a couple questions, but I think we really answered them all. Um, we had uh, somebody here who you know, we have some people raising their hands and you can write in a question and, and talk it out. But uh, bottom line, uh, there's a recommendation here. If you want to check out uh, the climate facts on cattle, uh, Frank uh, Middle Horner. So maybe you've already seen it, but that's, that's the recommendation. Anyway, Dr. Lau, Miao, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. Great. Thank you, Dr. Charles.